So let's consider a junction. in which we are applying some bias voltage. Like so. So this is our positive polarity terminal. This is our negative polarity terminal. And then we're going to have V bias, in this case, less than zero, okay? Uh, I will likely refer to this quantity as VR as a positive voltage from here on out, so I don't carry a whole bunch of negative signs all over the place. Uh, but effectively, we have the exact same situation as we had for last class, except that now our bias voltage is of the opposite polarity. Okay? Literally, nothing has changed, except that. Um, so let me draw some things here. Um, we have our neutral P region. Over here, we have our neutral N region. You guys all know what positive charge should be stored uh, in the space charge layer or the N side of the depletion region. Negative charge should be stored on the P side of the depletion region. Uh, we have carrier concentrations and all that jazz that we've kind of beat to death at this point. So what is the effect of us applying a negative voltage going to do to this crystal. So when we had a forward bias voltage for this polarity, we saw that that resulted in a reduction of the barrier potential, right? So now we're applying voltage that has the same polarity as the built-in voltage. So it's gonna cause the barrier potential to increase, okay? So barrier potential will increase. So we'll now have V naught minus V bias, again, same thing, um, which is the same as V naught plus VR. So it's getting bigger. So what does that mean? Well, it's even harder for majority carriers to diffuse across the junction. Okay. So the increase in the barrier potential makes the probability of diffusion of majority carriers very, very small, okay? Um, but it will actually cause minority carriers to diffuse very easily, which we'll talk about in a couple of moments, all right? Um, what's it gonna do to the electric field? Gonna make the electric field stronger or weaker? Stronger, right? The electric field is still going to be oriented from our positive charge. So let's call this right here just generically. Uh, this is Q sub N and it represents positive charge. This is Q sub P and it's negative charge. And so our field is still going to be oriented from right to left, but it's going to be even stronger now because we have another voltage contributed to it. So that means that the width of our depletion region is going to increase or decrease? Increase, right? The width of the depletion region is going to increase. And we can think about that in a pretty straightforward fashion, all right? So if we have positive charges or a positive potential terminal over here, right? We have a positive charge. What is it going to do to all the free electrons? It's going to attract them. So it's going to draw 
majority carriers this way, right? So electrons are gonna to wanna to go this way and the minority carrier holes are gonna get pushed towards the depletion region. We're gonna have a large negative charge over here. So the, negative, uh, the negative polarity terminal of our voltage source over here. Uh, that's gonna attract our majority carrier holes and it's gonna push our, our minority carrier electrons. So we're gonna say, holes will go this way. And electrons will go this way. And so if we looked at our carrier concentrations, actually before we even do that, the holes are getting pulled to the left and electrons are getting pulled to the right we should observe that the boundary of the space charge layer, the boundary of the depletion region moves because we're pulling holes from this region to the left. We're pulling electrons from this region to the right. And so our space charge layer boundaries get bigger. Uh, that is going to have an effect on the capacitance, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but I'm just kind of going over big picture things right now, okay? So, we should observe that the width of our depletion region, W, becomes two epsilon over Q, Na plus Nd divided by Na times Nd, times V naught plus VR, or I'm writing this in such a way that we observe that it's getting bigger. We can also, so the reason why I have this guy right here, we really only need to learn one set of equations if we understand what the sign of the voltage is doing, right? We could, if we put it instead of minus, or excuse me, plus VR here, if we put minus V bias with the understanding that V bias is negative, this is the exact same equation that we had for forward bias. We just know that when the voltage is applied in the opposite direction, it's gonna cause uh, the width of the depletion region to get larger instead of get smaller, right? So we really only need one set of equations if we are thinking about this thing correct, all right? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So if we look at our carrier concentrations, do this real quick. For a negative bias voltage, our whole concentration let me put my edge of my depletion regions here. So my whole concentration should look something like this. It's going to drop off and be effectively zero. And on this side, it's going to do something similar. My electron concentration and on this side, it's going to do something similar. And as we talked about a moment ago, we should have electron diffusion in this direction. And hole diffusion in this direction. But now we have a very, very large field. E. That's sweeping minority carriers through the depletion region. 
right? Effectively, there's such a large field being applied that we're imparting enough kinetic energy for them to go past each other with only really a minimal probability of recombination occurring, okay? So for a forward bias PN junction, we saw that we had majority carriers from the N side get injected into the P side. Majority carriers from the P side get injected into the N side. And that was the mechanism by which current wound up flowing, right? It was some level above the baseline caused diffusion to occur from uh, caused a diffusion current to occur from the P side of the crystal to the N side of the crystal. So current was flowing from left to right. Here we have minority carrier extraction, okay? So the field pulls minority carriers across. So holes are getting moved from the N side to the P side and adding a little bit over here. Similarly, electrons, excuse me, uh, electrons are getting moved from the P side to the end side. And so we have very, very similar conditions to what we observed for um, a forward bias current, except that all of our directions are backwards. So we can say that our current here J total is simply going to be Q and I squared times, excuse me, this should be DP, DP over LP ND plus DN over LN and A multiplied by the exponential of negative Q VR over KBT. Minus one. We have the exact same thing as we had last time. Um, but our direction of our current is changed. So if our reverse bias voltage is a little bit larger than KBT over Q or our thermal voltage, this exponential bit goes away, right? Or excuse me, this, um, yeah, so actually that's, that's a fantastic uh, If VR is a little bit larger than KBT, the exponential portion goes to zero, right? Which means we just have this guy right here multiplied by a factor of minus one, giving us the correct direction. So we can say that our reverse bias current it's just negative Q and I squared DP over LP times ND plus DN over LN times NA, which is just negative JS, what we got for our forward bias saturation current density. But what's interesting here, this value no longer depends on the applied voltage. It's effectively constant, right? So once we are a little bit beyond a reverse bias voltage uh, of greater than VT, our thermal voltage or KBT over Q, whatever the value happens to be at that temperature, the current through our diode is fixed, does not change as a function of voltage. So when we drew 
our current voltage relationship for diodes yesterday or Wednesday. If this is our bias voltage, and this is our total current, and the forward bias region we saw some exponential growth. And the reverse bias region, we should see a little bit of exponential growth as we get more and more negative until it effectively saturates to a point where a, ch a subsequent change in the reverse bias voltage does not cause an increase in the reverse bias current, okay? Now the scale of this graph is important uh, because this guy can ramp up onto the order of milliamps reasonably quickly. This guy is gonna be, if you've done your homeworks or anything yet, depending on the size of the junction, it's gonna be like picoamps, femtoamps, that kind of size. Very, very, very small, okay? Very, very small. So it's like 10 to the minus 12-ish amps is a reasonable value here, all right? So this is how our current behaves in a PN junction when we have forward bias, which is what's going on over here in quadrant one, and reverse bias, which is going on over here in quadrant number three. Um, any questions about this stuff? We didn't really derive anything because we did all of the derivation on Wednesday. By the exact same situation, just now current's going in the opposite direction, and the exponential portion of it goes away because of the way that the growth is occurring. All right, so what do you guys think is going to happen to our depletion layer capacitance that we discussed when we were talking about unbiased junctions? So, so actually, let's, let's put the brakes on that for a second. Should we observe diffusion capacitance in a reverse bias junction? No, because we don't have any minority carriers being injected. Right, so there absolutely will not be diffusion capacity to worry about in a reverse bias junction at all because there are not excess minority carriers that are being injected. Um, so now circling back around to the depletion capacities, right? We observed that because there was charge stored in the depletion region, right? There's positive charge stored on the N side, there's negative charge stored on the P side, and then the boundaries of the depletion region effectively acted as parallel plates. So we had charge stored because of a built-in voltage, and we had well-defined boundaries of where that charge was stored. So we treated it as if it were a parallel plate capacitor. We still have charge stored, we have a voltage, and now our plates are just spreading further apart. So what should we expect to happen to the depletion capacitance as the reverse bias voltage increases. The capacitance will decrease because the plates are moving further apart, right? So we know that C is equal to epsilon A over D. As D gets bigger, the capacitance goes down. How do you think our equation is going to change, right? So for an unbiased capacitor, CJ naught, we had sorry, I didn't bring my other notes with me. I uh, should be able to do this pretty easily. Q over Two, that does not look like an epsilon. ND times NA over NA plus ND times a factor of 
one over V naught, and this was all to the half cup, right? Something pretty close to this. You can check your notes from two class years ago. Make sure I didn't make any dumb mistakes. If we apply a reverse bias voltage, what's going to happen? Where do you think it's going to show up in this thing? Yeah, so we're just going to have plus VR right here. So our junction capacitance, when we are in an unbiased situation, simply becomes Q over two epsilon and A and D over N A plus N D times one over V naught plus V R to the one half power or another way that we can write it is just CJ naught divided by the square root of one plus VR over V naught. So this clearly illustrates that as the reverse bias voltage goes up, this denominator is becoming more and more uh, greater than one, which means the junction capacitance is going down. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so last thing that I want to talk about is the concept of reverse bias breakdown. So let me, uh, after you guys write this down, let me scroll back up for just a quick second here. So we have this graph. And a moment ago, I said, this current is independent of the reverse bias voltage. And that's very true up until a point. And the point at which it becomes not true depends on the semiconductor material and a couple of other things, okay? Uh, but what will happen is we will experience what's called reverse bias breakdown. And so let me do it in a different color here. The reverse bias breakdown current just means effectively very abruptly, we will start passing a massive amount of negative current. Um, if we do it for too long, this is just another way for us to burn a PN junction out, okay? There are two mechanisms by which reverse bias breakdown occurs. Uh, the first of which is avalanche breakdown and the second of which is Zener breakdown, okay? So let's talk about avalanche breakdown first because that's probably easier to understand. Excuse me. So if I have a junction, and I'm applying a voltage such that let me make sure I'm doing this the right way. VR is greater than VBR. So VBR is the breakdown voltage. I should expect to see that my depletion region is very wide. I've got this guy very negative or very reverse bias, which means I have a very large electric field. <clears throat> so let's say that I have a minority carrier electron on the P side of the junction. 
it's going to move towards the depletion region, right? Because we have a negative polarity terminal of our voltage source pushing it towards the depletion region. This very large electric field will impart that electron with a lot of energy. Okay. If the electric field is sufficient, it can impart that electron with enough energy that when it interacts with a silicon atom in the space charge layer or in the depletion region, it can knock an electron out of the valence band. So we would see almost like a little explosion here, which is going to generate another electron and a hole. Well, if that electron that was knocked out of the valence band is imparted enough energy, it can cause the exact same thing to happen. So let's say that this guy is still moving over here. We knock out another electron and another hole. And this guy knocks out another electron and another hole. And effectively our system stability has just gone straight to hell, right? So one electron knocks another electron out of the valence band, which knocks another electron out of the valence band, which knocks another electron out of the valence band and so forth and so forth and so forth we wind up generating a whole bunch of excess charge carriers. And that's why we see that our current goes through the roof, negatively through the roof. So through the floor, I guess, if you want to say it, because it's a reverse bias here, right? And so we're generating a bunch of electrons, excuse me, a bunch of electron hole pairs that are available for conduction because we put so much energy into our initial electron that it can cause other ones to jump straight from the valence band into the electric band, or excuse me, into the conduction band, thereby degrading the behavior of the device. Okay, so that's avalanche breakdown. Avalanche breakdown is an uncontrolled breakdown of the system. Okay, so it's kind of a, a runaway thing to where once it starts, it keeps going until you turn the power off and it can cause permanent damage to your PN junction. <clears throat> Our second mechanism is what's called Zener breakdown. Okay. Zener breakdown is what is used in Zener diodes. I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with those, but we're going to talk about them a little bit next week. So Zener breakdown occurs <clears throat> by design, all right? In a Zener diode, the width of the depletion region is very small because both the N side and the P side are very, very heavily dipped, okay? If we have a very, very small depletion region, if we drew the energy band structure for such a junction, it would look something like this. So our P side would be up here. And we can put our N side over here. this transition is the width of our depletion. So if we, as we bias this guy, we are shifting the energy band of the P side with respect to the N side, or relatively speaking, the N side with respect to the P side. So we're just moving either this guy up with respect to the N side's energy band, or we're moving this guy down 
with respect to the P sides energy band function. So there comes a point where electrons in the conduction band, so let's call this ECN, have roughly the same energy. Uh, this should be P as electrons or as the holes in the valence band of the P side. And so these electrons can easily bridge this gap, causing conduction to occur. So this is Zener breakdown, okay? <clears throat> we have a very specific energy band structure due to the doping concentrations on both sides. And then on top of that, we have to bias our uh, PN junction in such a way that the electrons in the conduction band on the inside can easily jump to this lower energy state or roughly similar energy state of holes on the P side of the crystal. And we see a rapid increase in uh, reverse bias current. Zener breakdown is much, much more stable. Uh, and so we actually wind up using Zener diodes or PN junctions designed like this um, in clamping and limiting circuits. So these guys wind up, uh, it's so stable effectively. So we have, I don't want to say an infinite amount of negative current because that's not true, but a very wide range of negative currents available for effectively a single value of voltage. So these guys are used as a negative voltage source in circuits. They, rep they create reference voltages um, because they behave so much like an independent voltage source. And as much as the voltage is fixed at effectively those breakdown, uh, at that breakdown voltage for a wide range of negative currents. So it behaves, uh, the voltage stays constant regardless of what the negative current is. So that's why they get a whole lot of application in uh, voltage regulator circuits, um, clamping circuits, limiting circuits, and all that kind of good stuff, right? So that was avalanche breakdown uh, and Zener breakdown. And that's enough out of me for today because it is so miserably hot in this room. <laughs>